one of my consistent consistency preaches to anybody who wants to get involved in this. There's nothing wrong with everything you've talked about, you know, doing yeah. all these other different yeah. types of things. Yeah. But start with the one that you can be some consistent in. And what is the one I believe Pearson can be the most consistent in is acquisition and holding long-term single family, period. Mm-hmm. That, to me, will be the absolute best base you could possibly get. I mean, it's, actually, there's, there's another base I think that would be even better. You're listening to The Azria Show. If you're looking for quality real estate investing information that you can trust, you've found it. Stay tuned and join the tens of thousands of members that have already benefited from Azria, your home for education, market information, support, and networking opportunities that will advance your real estate investing career. Hello, 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 Azria family and everyone across the Western Seaboard. It's your boy, Marcus Maloney, and I have our executive director, Mike Del Preet. Hello, hello. And this is the Azria Show, and welcome to the Azria Show. On today, we want to talk with Aaron Chapman. If you're familiar with Azria, you've seen Aaron on our stage before, but Aaron is a lender and has been a lender for over how many years? Over 25 years, right? 1997, so whatever that adds up to. I don't even want to do the math right now. So before some of you guys were born, Aaron was already in the industry (laughs) doing deals, right? Not to date Aaron, but that's who you want to hear from. You want to hear from seasoned investors, lenders, professionals. So Aaron, man, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, man. Being able to come in and hang out with you guys again. Yes, yes. When, when, when is it a bad damn day? When you're hanging yeah, out man. with cool ass people that know what they're talking about, they're all for the exact same objective, which is to help you guys that are listening become something more than what you are today. And it's not because you don't want to be, it's because maybe you just don't know. Yep, yep, yep. Well, let them know how. So, so Aaron was on our podcast before. You know, we're not going to go deep into his bio and everything like that. If you want to know more about Aaron, go to episode 91 from Cattle Rancher to Property Powerhouse. That's all about Aaron's backstory and everything like that. And I suggest you go back and listen to that. That way you have a clear perspective of who this guy is because he's very, very powerful. And by the end of this podcast, you'll know how powerful he is. So Aaron, man, what are we talking about today? Well, number one, you just set the stage. Now I got to be all powerful. Be <laughs> <laughs> yourself, man. Exactly. I mean, it's like going off like a silverback on coke in here. But so, what? Well, one, the the real estate powerhouse situation. It really just comes from something I like to tell everybody. It's like good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. You get to learn a lot of things when you're doing the same thing over and over yeah. again since 1997. It's not necessarily what I did personally. It's what I see other people do. I've had the blessing of having tens of thousands of clients. Uh, my database is pretty damn extensive, and that's only been tracking since, like, uh, since after the crash 2008. So you start to see what decisions people made pre-crash, what decisions they're making post-crash, and then what decisions they're making now which is literally starting to lead up to some of the things that led to the crash of 2008. So our whole goal is to bring data to others to help them to see what's ahead of them, what are they experiencing, and what could be the possible outcomes. Think through your outcome before you make your decision. There's a lot of shiny objects out there. Oh, yeah. But unfortunately, the shiny objects are only going to benefit one side. They never benefit all sides. Mm -hmm. You get to the really boring stuff, it benefits all sides. Yep. And it's one of these things I try to tell all, it's amazing in business. So many people be, treat business like war, right? It's like, we're just going to go out and fight this whole yeah. thing. And it's like, I'm going to try and win at all costs. But war is not everybody, one side wins and one side loses. It's who can, who can take the most devastation and still be standing. Mm-hmm. That's not a good business model. Right. So when you're out there trying to benefit everybody and lift everybody up, everybody wins. Everybody yeah. wins. Yep. Right. That, I mean, how, how is that a bad thing for yeah. everybody to freaking win instead of one person having to win? There's no such thing as one person yeah. winning in business. And that should be the goal, right, for everyone to win. And one, one of the things that you said that was very, very key is you said consistency, right? How powerful is that word consistency? And for people in the industry either getting started, why should they be consistent in one area versus, like you said, you see people start this and then they bounce around and they go from things, different things. Have you ever read the book by Napoleon Hill called Outwitting the Devil? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amazing book, right? Yep. I mean, I read Think and Grow Rich, and that was a great book. And then I read Outwitting the Devil, and I'm like, damn, yeah. that's even ballsier <laughs> yeah. than what we were seeing in the other. And mm-hmm. there's a part in there, and anybody who's not read it, guys, get it. 
I would recommend reading it and then listening to the audio and then do the two together. Because the audio, if you guys haven't done the audio, yeah, it's freaking amazing, right? Okay. So I used to do rescue for the sheriff's office years ago, and I, I just did a, a cave rescue at Oracle Cave. And we're driving back, and it's you know, a good hour and a half drive, so I turned on the audio. Mm-hmm. And what kicked on with the audio is they have two different voices, one for the author and mm-hmm. one for the devil himself. And when yeah, that yeah, voice yeah. kicked in, oh. it was dark, man. I'm driving through the Arizona desert, back roads, heading back from Oracle, and I'm like, oh, holy crap, that was creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's some real depth to it and one of the things he said in there uh there's a question says hey you you claim napoleon hill was claiming he was sitting on the steps of the lincoln memorial having a conversation with the devil himself that right there is a powerful statement itself and he said he asked him he said you said that you can control 98 percent of the population how do you do that he says by influencing them to drift so that leads right back to your question so being consistent if you are inconsistent and your direction is being pointed one after another and you're looking for the shiniest object all the time you never ever do get you you can't have any focus on anything and never accomplish anything it's like michelangelo carving the statue of david if he kept changing his mind what would he have mm-hmm. an extremely expensive pi- pile of gravel yep. rather than one of the most recognized statues and masterpieces on the planet same thing with you it's going to get hard i'm sure there's certain parts of his anatomy the anatomy he was carving out that wasn't easy but right. he stayed consistent right to have the have the uh, the final product same with us being a lender in the in the Arizona area, and I do it nationally for real estate investors, is definitely not an easy thing. During post crash, it was the hardest thing you could possibly ever do because nobody wanted to lend to real estate, so called real estate investors. Mm-hmm. After that, but I stayed at it, stayed at it, stayed at it. I had to fight everybody in the industry. I'm not fighting my own companies. I'm fighting Fannie. I'm fighting Freddie to convince them that the real estate investor was the best bet for them. Want to know what it is now? Everybody in the world wants to be a real estate investment lender. Yeah. Everybody thinks that they're an expert. All these guys that are so-called experts in the industry right now have been at it since since 2012. They've never seen a real market. Yeah. 1997, I've seen some crazy cycles. And we're in a spot right now where we haven't even seen a cycle since 2008. We're due for a cycle that's completely different than what people believe. Wow. So. That was a really good answer. Almost as if we, we scripted it. Yeah, that right. was very good. <laughs> no, no, was a great answer. No, no, there's, there's a lot there. So one, Michelangelo used to dissect bodies to see the inside so they could sculpt them. Isn't that pretty I cool? I did not know that. Yeah. But, um, oh, Mike, look at you. I read that somewhere. <laughs> um, hey, but, read that yeah, somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So, so the drifter, so let's go back. That was a great question, right? Because yeah. when you're new, people, they come to Azria, they're like to they go to the fix and flip class, the landlord class, the wholesaling class and they're just jumping around and trying to find their way which is fine mm-hmm. but and we always say what's your goal a financial freedom time freedom that's everyone's goal more time with family travel and they they always want to do these active um ways of making money mm-hmm. to get to financial freedom which is rentals i'm gonna do this this that and one day i'm gonna buy my rental and i always go you could buy your rental now right mm-hmm. if we just sat down and talked about it so be consistent like pick you could be a landlord now and just be consistent at it, right? So stop drifting. I love that. What yeah. one of my consistent consistency preaches to anybody who wants to get involved in this? There's nothing wrong with everything you've talked about. You know, doing yeah. all these other different yeah. types of things. Yeah. But start with the one that you can be some consistent in. And what is the one I believe Pearson can be the most consistent in? Is acquisition and holding long-term single family. Period. Mm-hmm. That to me will be the absolute best base you can possibly get. I mean, it's. Actually, there's there's another base I think that would be even better. I don't know if we want to get too deep into it, but it's the infinite banking strategy, utilization of whole life policies, yeah. take your capital, buy there yeah. first, use that to go into your single families and go from there. And if you can literally start from that foundation yeah. and that's where you build, then you can do the little bit more, it might even be considered a little bit risky. I think a lot of, some of your multifamily can get risky in certain areas. Yep. Uh, some of your fix and flips can get risky because you don't know the what's going to happen in the market. Mm -hmm. The market can switch something really quick on you. But if you have a solid base of say 15, 20 single families that are consistently being rented, that are being paid off by your, by your, and we'll get into this when I, when I'm speaking on, on uh, what day am I speaking? Monday, June 10th, Monday, June 10th, Monday, June 10th, June 11th, June 11th, and June 15th. Okay. So (laughs) June 10th, I'm speaking in Phoenix and June 11th in Tucson Mm -hmm. and then June 15th back here in Phoenix for the full day. Maybe four hours a day, not the full day. You can only take so much Aaron Chapman. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
we're going to get into the depth of all this and we're going to get really deep into the numbers. I love the numbers and the charts, which is really interesting to say because I, I cheated my ass off in high school to get that C and get out. <laughs> um, I was not a math guy, but I've become a very, very heavy, heavy math guy because of the application of it. But when you're talking about that base of single families and you have the ability to have somebody else pay off the mortgage, you're not paying it. And you do that long term. You have the ability to uh, appreciate even as, as something as small as two and a half percent the real estate investor can see a 20 plus percent return on their initial investment consistently year over year over year that's only going to grow from there when the cash flows grow when the tax returns get to get to get filed it's only going to grow right and the other thing i'll continue to preach and you guys will hear about it in person never ever ever pay off your mortgage quickly never never do mm. the debt snowball never pay more than what they tell you the only time that the only person that wins when you pay more if you say, hey, I'm going to put an extra $100 a month towards my mortgage and try and put it there instead of investing it somewhere else, the one who wins is the bank. They want you to do that. They want you to pay it off faster. They also want you to refinance often. The re that's why interest rates are the most important thing in the deal to most of the mm -hmm. world because yeah. you've been convinced by the media, or by the banking industry, that when you do that, it benefits you, when in reality, it benefits them. And I will show that to you. I'll give you all the math and the numbers. You can decide for yourself if I'm full of it. But I know dang well, after nearly 30 years of doing what I'm doing, I know where who's winning, and I know how to help you win. And that's, that's yeah. really key, right? Because what you're saying about paying off your mortgage early and everything like that is so many pundits, so many personalities that always say, you know, put an extra $100 towards a mortgage, get it paid off quicker, everything like that. So, yeah, you guys definitely need to be there, you know, next week to hear what Aaron has to say about, you know, becoming bankable, being bankable, and not paying off your mortgage. I'm curious now even about that. Although I may think I know where you're coming from, <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna make sure I'm near to make sure well, I got a grab. And, and if you guys think you know where I'm coming from, come and, and at least confirm. Yeah, confirm, right. Confirm exactly. that you know that, that you're on the right track or come with it with your arguments. Let's slug mm -hmm. it out. I'll put the gloves on with anybody. and I'll go mm -hmm. Pepsi challenge against with anybody else's philosophy on paying off a mortgage early or doing a 15 year loan or a 10 year loan, or let's do an arm because there's all these people talking about, well, if you get the five year arm today, you can get like a 5.99% and then you just refinance you when the rates go down. Yeah. I'm sorry guys, they're not freaking going down. I mm. don't believe they're gonna go down. We, we're all familiar with the name uh, Warren Buffett, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. We all respect that name. Mm -hmm. He said that the 30 year fix is the greatest financial instrument in history. Do you know why? Why is that? He said it's a yeah. one way bet. If you lock and the rates go up, you're protected. But if the rates go down and you feel like refinancing, you can do that. You can do that. So it's an extremely powerful instrument. When you're talking about uh, Warren Buffett, we don't know his business partner, Charlie Munger. Yeah. You remember, remember Charlie? He recently passed. 2023, I think it was January or February, he had a, an interview with Christy Quick. And I think she's with CNBC, if I remember correctly. In that interview, I had a clip. I saved the clip. Actually, I saved the link to the clip. I didn't save the clip. Where he said, we had 40 years of declining interest rates. We are now set for 40 years of increasing interest rates. Mm. I went to go back to that clip to share it on a share it with some folks taken down. You can't access that clip. I watched wow. over almost seven hours of versions of that interview and that phrase is gone. So lock in. Wow. They took that away. Why did they take that away? Because that's not benefiting the banking industry. Right. It's definitely not benefiting those who are pulling the strings for you to know that they don't want you to know that I'm one of the few people on the world that's preaching that. Now, if I preach it too loud and too many people hear it, I'm just going to let you guys know right now I'm not suicidal. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and if this episode is not on the internet anymore. <laughs> you know, that'd be so, so, okay. So now 40 years inclined interest, and now we have inflation and high pricing. How's, how are we going to even buy houses yeah. or be in the they, business? They, they don't want you to. Of course. That's the yeah. point. They don't yeah, want you yeah. to buy houses. Think about the next generations, right? My, my children, my oldest is 27. I got 27, 25, and 23, I think. <laughs> so my, my wife will bust my balls when I get this right. But I do have a 17-year-old. I know yeah, that because yeah. she's still in the house. But they've all moved on. They've all been married. And so we had a house in Gilbert on an acre and a quarter. My kids nice. grew up there. Mm -hmm. And then in when my oldest was like 17 years old, we sat down. I said, you want something? We need to figure out how I'm going to help them get springboarded into life. Yep. So I sat them all down. I opened up the books. This is how much money I make. This is where, they, where, where we're invested at. These are all the things. And I want you guys to be involved in it going forward. The first question that came out of all their mouths when they saw what I was making and what we had, then why do we live, live here? here. Yeah. Right? I said, because you're not going to have a different experience than I had growing up. I grew up in a three bedroom or four bedroom house, three bedroom house, whatever with, mm -hmm. with four kids. 
that's what we had three bedroom house with four kids it was not comfortable in most yeah. cases i was fairly comfortable because i didn't give a crap my master was a certain way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. theirs was set up a little bit more stacked up but now we bought the house next door rehabbed it and then my older kids that were married had to rochambeau for who's gonna who's gonna take the house they grew up in uh-huh. to live next door so my daughter and her husband's there and i have two grandkids next door but my son had an apartment with his wife my third child she had an apartment with her husband in idaho and we got to talking about what they need to do and we as a family trust bought houses in missouri and they moved to missouri okay so when i bought those houses i sold other assets that we had took the cash bought those houses mm-hmm. and then what i did was i set the rehab refinance on those homes and we'll get into this when we get into the burr strategy class that i'm going to do for for asria probably two or three months down the road mm-hmm. to get into how to structure these things to get your cash back out properly it's it is very very fine out it's something you got to do it correctly from the very beginning so i test this myself i do this myself we pull out just enough cash to where they will pay a certain amount in rent every single month so it does not affect their ability to pay their rent but then we increase it by $200 for everybody in the family. So everybody, let's okay. just say, pays 1400 bucks a month, and then they pay another 200 which is now 1600 The 200 extra goes into the middle in a, in a warranty, if you will, for the family. So we're all building up this warranty account okay. to the extent of where we're going to reach 50000 Once we reach 50000 we kick it back down to 1400 So everybody's paying that rent, and it maintains the mortgages. And then if that 50000 if somebody's roof blows off, we can fix it, and then we bump it back up to 1600 till we have right. that reserve again, and we, we play that way. So now I have a 17-year-old coming up. When she gets married, we need to do the same. But each one of our family members, they all have the infinite banking. Um, they have that on their spouse. We have meetings once a month on what money's coming in and what's money going out, and we're managing this together. Because if we don't do that, what's the next generation going to do? You guys can be badasses of what you do. You can build your real estate. You can have a massive amount of wealth being generated, and then something happens to you, and then what? Massive death benefit comes in. You've got 20 houses. The kid's like, let's go buy Ferraris. This is going to be awesome. You need to have them involved now. So you talked about how you wanted to build your business to make all this money so you can have time with your family. Just involve them in it now. Mm -hmm. have time with your family now in your business we separate ourselves from them not intentionally because we don't know any different but I had a nine-year-old sitting in those meetings and then texting my infinite banking guy questions about how he manages his 50 houses if you can get that kind of wiring working at nine years old can you imagine what they'll be like at 18 19 20 it's a completely different generation of people when you involve them in what you're doing today so never discount the fact that the six-year-old may not want to sit through something but something Mm -hmm. might spark their interest The other thing that's interesting about this was being able to bring investment opportunities on from across the country onto a Zoom platform and have my family sit around a table and ask questions. What you start to find is you're doing benefiting two sides. You're benefiting the ones offering the investment because they now have to learn how to dumb down their presentation to be able to communicate to a Mm nine-year-old so they can vote in the family vote. But also the nine-year-old and the 15-year-old and the 17-year-old has to up their intelligence enough to ask intelligent questions. So you're benefiting both sides. And I've been on those Zoom calls with families before, helping them to start putting together the same type of thought process. I become that benevolent uncle that the kids will call now and again and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think Mm -hmm. about that? Because sometimes it's hard to hear it from the parent. Yeah. Right? We're so used to them telling, don't do that. Don't do that without an excuse or a reason. Well, now you get to talk to somebody else who has a, a reason to give you yeah. a reason. And it changes everything. And I think we have a massive responsibility to change the next generation's thinking, to change the next generation's ideas of what, what is real and what's not, and to help them see how much is being dumped on us that's completely fictitious and pushing us a direction to be slaves to the engine, not to creating the future for ourselves. And, and that's, that's, that's very good, Aaron, because that's true legacy building. That's true wealth building for generations, right? Because everybody throw out this word, you know, generational wealth, but they're really only thinking about themselves and what can they pass on to their kids. But if their kids don't have the foundational elements and the basic elements of what to do when they inherited all of that stuff, then it's not really true, you know, wealth. So good question. You were speaking on mathematics, right? You was talking about well, when you was in school, you know, you wasn't a math guy, but now you're a lender. You see the purpose and the reason for the mathematics. Speak to the people that don't understand the reason why they need to do the foundations of single family rentals or whatever, you know, versus fix and flips or wholesale transactions or whatever. So 
the wholesale transaction fix and flips those are all great great instruments you will learn more in the ownership of things long term on how to be better at the fix and flips yep. how to be better at these other quick transactions than how to set up your capital correctly one of the things that they you, they're saving money, putting all this money aside, trying to take that capital and then then to invest into fix and flip, hoping to double it or triple it, and it could happen. Mm -hmm. But what happens when it gets cut in half? Mm -hmm. Right now, you're back at that at that exactly. drawing board again, and the problem that you have when it gets cut in half is like, man, I just spent years saving that, and I got years again in an inflationary environment. Yeah. The cost of housing is only going up, yeah. and I don't see it going doing anything but that. There's gonna be some pockets that are gonna drop. I'm gonna have these people from Florida or or from Texas saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we're seeing a drop over here." Yeah, because you had a freaking influx of Californians mm -hmm. like none other, and then it paused. Yeah. Well, we don't have enough people pushing the price up. It's gonna drop, but it's not not going down from what it was before all that rage, right? Mm -hmm. It's still high, still extremely high. So it so it dips off of a peak. That doesn't right. mean you're not still having an overinflated house price. But when you're talking about buying something long term, you set that price. And that value of the house is set at the day you bought it, and it continues to compound while somebody else is paying it off with your mortgage. And then you have that base of, of like you said, legacy being built. You know, mm -hmm. the, the the definition of legacy, I think, is is incorrect when you start looking at what what anybody defines it as. It's money being passed on. It's not money. It's knowledge being knowledge, passed on. Yep. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we have we have put a monetary value to legacy. And it's not a monetary mm -hmm. value. So you have something to pass on, which is that. And that will also give you the capability when you build up the value of those homes to get lines of credit or something to that effect to buy those properties, mm -hmm. right? So instead of using your own personal cash to invest in, there's nothing wrong with doing those fix and flips or some of those types of deals, uh, rehab loans or bird deals with your own personal cash. I think it's do it, but get a base that is set for 30 years that's going to be a consistent flow for you. Now, you have to have a little bit of knowledge on how to do that. You have to get the right team to work with right. you. You're the CEO of your real estate investment business. If you buy in an area that doesn't rent, that doesn't help you. You might as well have done the fix and flip and lost all right, your money, right. right? But if you buy something and keep it reasonably rented the entire time you own it, and you can raise rents on it and depreciate at least 2.5%, you're going to do very well. You will hand off something to the next generation that nobody else in your family has ever done. You will be that change. You know, mm -hmm. the Rockefeller name was nothing before a guy named John D. Rockefeller, correct? Yep. Nobody knew that name. Nobody gave a shit about that name. But then you have the one guy, the one guy who changed it all. You, anybody listening to this right now, you can be the one guy who changed yeah. it all. You can be that person. You just have to decide what you're going to do and how to go about it. I, this is my belief. You have to get, for your, get it for your own beliefs in place is setting up those single families first. And the best way for me to even articulate that is that's why the hedge funds are buying the hell out yep, of it. Yep. They're trying to turn us into a subscription-based economy. And if you don't believe that, look at the New York Times. They're putting it out right now that yep. you make more money renting than you do buying. You do buy you're, you're on the Azria podcast for a freaking reason because you know that's a lie. Well, mm -hmm. let the rest of the world believe it. When the crowd's running one direction, you go the other. Go the other. difference we have right now, we know where they're going to intersect us. If we can run ahead and get intersect where they're, gonna where they're running and they become your subscribing to you yep. right in yep. a subscription based economy that you either subscribing or be you're the offering the subscription you get to be offering the subscription on the heels of the hedge funds they're spending billions of dollars to advertise what you need them to advertise you don't even have to advertise it it's, it's so i've heard rough stat 65 <clears throat> percent of like the single family rentals in maricopa are the mom and pop right so then now we have the inflation the high rates the hedge funds like everything we've been you've been covering um now we have that last year they proposed 25 anti-landlord bills. Okay, who's that hurt? It hurts yeah. the mom and pop. Oh, wow. yep. You know, longer evictions and you know so on. So that's that comes out of our savings, our retirement, right? So it goes along with everything you're saying. The uh, and then was it was the stat about how many hedge hedge funds bought how many houses? They bought 44 percent of the single available single families last year. They anticipate by 2030 they will they could control 60 percent of the available single family housing. Uh, as far as rentals are concerned. Now, you're right about the statistic of mom and pops. Yep. They own the majority of them. Right. I've actually had more than one opportunity to sit with members of Congress and members of the Senate and explain to them that their bills that they're proposing, who they really impact. Mm -hmm. Because right. they think that they're, in, that they're on some 
you know, holy crusade to stop the hedge funds from taking over. But the problem is how it's being written only benefits the hedge funds. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that the largest percentage of the single family houses that are made available to rent are by mom and pops. Mm -hmm. yep. And I had one of them, I think it was, I think it was Maxine Waters, I wouldn't say chief of staff, but one of her, one of her aides, chief aides, where she's like, wow, wait a minute, that was, and I could be wrong on which one it was, because mm -hmm. there's a lot I met with. She's like, yeah, that's my grandparents. They have like five single family houses. It's like, do you realize that 70 plus percent of that, that, uh, statistic you offered are controlled by people who have less than five homes. Yep. When you start putting that kind of control, you're literally destroying people's destroying. future. Yep. And so we're, we're, they want to have 401ks and IRAs and Social Security for all these people to be able to make a, uh, their, have a retirement on. Those are being destroyed. People mm -hmm. are cashing those in to buy real estate, and now they're going to create legislation to hurt that real hurt, estate? Yeah. So yeah. that's where we have a responsibility to get involved in our local elections, too. Not just to vote. But go get in front of these people and start having conversations. And I think we, we as, as our group here, I'm sure, mm -hmm. could, could uh, stand to have a little bit more conversation about how do we get in there we, to our local folks and start busting some balls. We have to. That's yeah. one of the part of the existence of Azri is we always spoke on behalf of the small real estate investor. And more than ever, like they're changing the – the the messaging out there like you said so being a renter's nation right mm -hmm. people rather just travel and be own a home mm -hmm. think all these messages that are going out there so it's 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 changing so we have to speak up on that you know anyways man and you like, it's, it's, let's let's explore that for a second yeah. let's say it does become a renter's nation let's yeah. say people would rather travel than own a home yeah but how many percent of that what percent of the population would rather own a home and own multiple homes and become the landlords and then let's talk about this when you're talking about a person that owns five six seven ten properties how is that person compared to a corporation that owns thousands of properties? Right. When you're talking about somebody who's down to luck, having a hard time paying rent, and they're ready to negotiate. I got a person out in Missouri right now because of seasonal parts of their job. They have times where they have to split their rent up, and maybe they're a little bit late. I, it doesn't bother me. They communicate yep. with me. Right. I'm okay with that. Right. If they them. were the corporation, they would have kicked them out kicked a long damn time ago. They'd have been on the street. She has a she has a, a very very young child, and she's pregnant with another. Would yeah. they mm -hmm. care? No. We need to empower the powers that be, if you even call them, I'll call them powers, yeah. our elected officials who are supposed to act on our behalf to understand coming up with a new bill that you think is going to be benevolent is not benevolent whatsoever. Yeah, you may put your name in the history books, but you've screwed a lot of people in the process. We need to educate them on who they represent. The problem is they don't know. What they do know is what's the noise that they're hearing. The noise yeah. that they're hearing is is sometimes the smallest part of the population screaming the loudest because they have time to scream. Yeah, mm -hmm. We need to scream. And just like from our the messages we get as Rhea and our comments and social media, like just the, everyone's just like, I can't afford a house, right? It's impossible to buy a house, right? But it's not, right? And then when you respond back and have these dialogues with people, they just think you're BS. And so it's like, here's your chance to come hear Aaron on Monday, mm -hmm. Tuesday, and Saturday and see how you could actually buy your rental. Am I exaggerating? Like if your credit, your job yes. is everything in place, you could, you knew what you're doing as an investor, you get the proper training. You could buy a house in 30 days. You easily buy a house days. in 30 days and we can help you, yeah. help you accomplish that. And sometimes it's not in Arizona. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just let me, let me just lay that out here, yeah. guys. I know we represent Arizona in our conversation here. I do business in 30 states. I've got connections all over the planet. I've been doing this for a very long time. People ask me where I live. I says seat 3D of American Airlines. My yeah. ass is in the air all the time, visiting different markets, talking to different operators in those markets. Sometimes you got to go to the South and the Midwest, but you got to get started somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Arizona is one of those really interesting hybrid markets that sometimes it's not the best market to buy mm -hmm. in, especially for somebody starting out. Right. Let us help you get started. And then you'll you'll get where you need to get it may be slower it may be interesting steps it may not be the steps you thought you would take but they're stop steps that you need to make so so on the 15th saturday june 15th 9 a.m here at the Ezria office so we're talking about how to become bankable how to look good on paper yep. so how, someone that's you know maybe they have some rentals and maybe their credit's not right or they just don't know what they look like on paper or you're brand new you don't even know what that means right so what are you going to kind of cover on saturday well, I'm going to get into the depths of how do you get financing, what what are, what are you looking at as far as your income and your assets. I'm going to actually have underwriters there in, in the room with us. Oh, wow. Okay. So that way we can ask deep, deep, deep questions. It's not just take Aaron's word for it. I got people who have been, you know, one of the underwriters that are, they're going to be there. She's been doing this since 1982. Wow. Okay. She's probably going to be pissed I even said that. Another <laughs> one's been doing it since 1985. 
these women have been working with me for a very long time. One of them, she's been working with me since 2009. Great. So we have a long history of working with investors, a long history of helping people get qualified. And we know the nuances of what's acceptable and what's not. Mm -hmm. I've had my hand slapped a thousand times. I've been audited. I've had those conversations. What's cool about that is you get to ask questions and then they give you answers. So don't ever take an inquiry or an ass whooping as a negative because right. then right. then you're actually in a in a in a in a face to face conversation you get to ask okay well, what what was this where did i get this wrong and they get to explain it so mm -hmm. now you got oh now i can do this and they actually let you know you probably have more capability than what you thought right so we can lead people to different directions the thing of it is there's a lot of it's going to be something you've already heard i'm not going to have any magic smoke mm -hmm. to put out there and poof you into some sort of all of a sudden bankable investor it might take work you may yeah. have put yourself in a position that you're going to have to unravel some things. Yeah. You know, sometimes the best deal you do is a deal you don't do. Right. Right. And so sometimes mm -hmm. that is not moving forward now until you fix everything you've done in the past. But where we are, like I think it was Einstein that said, you are now where you are because of your best thinking. Well, let's change some of your thinking and help you understand where you thought incorrectly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the class, it's like, hey, you need to get your credit up and here's how you do it. At least you walk away with like a plan. Action steps. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying you're going to get that. Saturday, but like if you go through the pre-approval process, mm -hmm. being that person that wants to become an investor, yes, get the ugly stuff out of the way, figure out what you got to fix and take a couple months to fix it, then you'll have a property. Yeah. Sometimes it's just it's a matter a of changing your lifestyle for a little while. Yeah. Yep. Pay some things off. The things that people don't realize is how bad short-term credit is for you. Mm -hmm. That's one of the worst things you can possibly get, especially in-store credit cards. Get rid of those damn yeah. things. Highest interest there is. Mm -hmm. Temptation to buy while you're in there. It's a it's a instant gratification world that we're living in. Yep. And because of that, it is very, very harmful. So we'll get away from the instant gratification stuff and focus you on long term. And once you get that into your mind and rewire your brain a bit, that you can start seeing yourself being able to achieve what you need to achieve, hopefully within 12 months or less. Because yeah. one, one of the biggest mistakes I see with people that's either looking to get into real estate or looking to buy their first home or whatever it is, they really don't know what their credit looks like because they're scared to look at hmm. what's on their credit, right? Yeah, you're scared to look at your bank account or your credit. That's the first. <laughs> yeah. We got to fix that first. So you, know? so <laughs> you got to be able to face those hard truths. Like, uh -huh. like Aaron said, you got to know where you're at, right? Because I was, I mean, honestly, I just did this last week. I was looking at how much money I was spending on fast food because I was, always on a go going 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 and i was like god dog i spent 450 dollars a month in fast food i can take that 450 dollars put that in an interest bearing investment and let that money grow yeah you know so it's having those tough conversations and sitting down and evaluating where you are doing an asset inventory on yourself and see where you are that way you can make those informed decisions. Yeah, you have to take that $450 you're investing in fast food, put it somewhere it can grow yep. a little bit, so that way you can afford to buy the new clothes that you're going to have to fit in because you stop eating your <laughs> stop fast eating food, right? Stop eating the fast food, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you're... So, what kind well, of a lot of them wasn't eating. meat eating. Oh, all right, I was going to say, Mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to help you out here, buddy. 450 bucks. But 450 bucks doesn't stretch far in fast food anymore. I mean, it was 19, 1993. Yeah. I walked into a Taco Bell, and this was my first time I walked into a Taco Bell. That's why it stands out in my mind. And they had their value menu. I was able to buy two two crunchy tacos and two bean burritos and a drink for $1.99. Now, fast forward 30 years later, this last year in 2023, I was taking my daughter back to the school for something. I can't remember what it was, but she wanted to stop by Taco Bell. I don't eat that crap anymore, but I rolled mm -hmm. through the, uh, not that I don't like it. I can still handle Come me on, one the of those. Crunch, the oh, those Mexican pizzas, or, dude. Okay. The Mexican pizza is freaking <laughs> awesome. So we're rolling through the uh, through the drive through and she ordered exactly that. Now, they didn't have a value, value menu anymore for that, but it was two, bean bur two crunchy tacos, two bean burritos, and a drink. You know what I spent for that? 12 bucks. 15 bucks. See. That went up 700%. So guys, that 450 bucks is not that hard to be able to get there yeah. when you're talking about the cost of things. And it's not that, and I'll go into this on Monday when we're speaking and then again on Tuesday, it's not that the tacos are worth more and it's not that the drink is worth more. It's what we're exchanging it for is worth mm -hmm. so much less. Yep, dollars so can you, less. Can you pull up those stats in the beginning before the show started? The the fourplex was like a million. Yes. Uh, those those. those those are great stats. Yeah, yeah, that was good. So was when good. I when I got in the industry and you know, where this came from, we were talking about the fact that I've been in it for so stinking long. So in 1997, I got into it and I was looking at, this is yesterday, I pulled mm. up a picture of my business card and who knows, maybe put it in the show notes. I'll send All you right. a picture so they can see what the hell I looked like uh -huh. back then. I've got my 2003 business card. 
that business card, well, in 97, the jumbo, or at least the conforming loan limit for a single family was $214,600. Hmm. That was the conforming loan limit. Anything above that, so $214,601 was, like was a Paradise jumbo Valley, loan. That was like Scottsdale. Right? Yeah, like that's that, a massive, yeah. massive yeah. house, right? The, the fourplex was $412,450. That was the max loan they could do on a fourplex with a 30-year fixed conventional loan. Now, fast forward to the day, 2024. A single family maximum conforming loan is seven hundred sixty-six thousand five hundred. The the four family or the fourplex, one point four seven four million. That's Crazy. the loan amount. That's after twenty-five percent down, guys. Yeah, man. Who's paying that much right. money for a fourplex? That's crazy. So, when you think about that, and that our price of housing has gone up that much, and it hasn't even been thirty years. So, what's four hundred fifty dollars of fast food in? 25 years <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's right. like eighteen thousand dollars a month market <laughs> well we're looking at, if we're if we're taking the taco bell effect right it is a 700 percent. so it's seven you know divide that by seven is what i'm guessing so he's a he's a lone, yep, he's a lone yep. guy so he's breaking it yeah, down 450 down. if he's being accurate and truthful about his 450 he didn't, 454. Shave, off, didn't shave a few points off What's that 454. 454 okay so i'll type in four origination fee <laughs> So it's sixty four bucks back thirty years ago. Wow. Sixty four bucks a month. Wow, crazy. Spending. See, wow. it's not just real estate we can cover here. Sixty five. Yeah. So, so, and that tells you about the, it, what yeah. inflation is doing. So, literally, what it what you could have bought sixty five with sixty five dollars thirty years ago it cost you four hundred fifty four dollars. That's how inflation works. How many times have you gone to the grocery store and think, damn, man, I spent two hundred bucks. My mom used to have a train of three carts. carts yep. and we had two guys helping us to load all the shit. I remember she would go shopping at six a.m. She kicked me out of bed. Come on, we're going to go get groceries for the week. And it would be three shopping carts. We'd fill the entire trunk, fill the entire back seat. And I am just buried in everything. Mm -hmm. In the front seat, I'm having to just look out amongst all the bags. And then we have to unload all that stuff and put away. And it was under 200 bucks. Now, 200 bucks will fit in two bags. Easy. Easy. That's what's happening in our world. Just to be able to buy food. It was a statistic that just came out. The average American has to have an increase in the last 18 months of $11,000 a year in their income just to continue to maintain their food costs. And you can do all that by buying houses. Yep. Yes, because of the appreciation in the houses. Yep. What's really, really awesome about this, and we'll get really deep into it on the stage, I don't want to I don't want to, to spoil it now, but what you guys got to remember when you're doing a 30-year fixed loan, and don't listen to anybody that tells you anything different, come to the event so I can explain it in greater detail. But that 30-year fixed, that cost is set for 30 years you can buy the taco shells and the beans and the meat and the cheese and all that crap to make your tacos for 30 years but continue to sell it for higher and higher mm -hmm. and higher can you imagine what taco bell's margins would be right now if they set they're able to set Man. their prices or their contracts in 1993 for all those items and then be able to sell it today's market no. they're making money to be able to keep those uh, those those locations open at a dollar 99 for those four items five items including the drink can you imagine what their margins were if they could have maintained that price yeah. point at today's cost of 15? Where would they be now? Costco's doing it with the hot dog. But there's also skimflation, so I don't know what's, going on. Well, I don't know what's in that hot dog. <laughs> yeah, right. So you consider that. But think cool. about that. Yeah. That's what you're doing with the 30-year fixed. You're setting your costs for 30 years yeah. while you get to increase the rents and you get the appreciation on the home. That's true, so man. don't love ever discount the value of setting your expenses for 30 freaking years. And, and what I'll do, so check Aaron out at the, the monthly meeting at Scottsdale, yep. Venue 8600, June 10th, Monday night, June 11th at the Tucson Association of Realtors, and then here at the Central Phoenix office, June 15th at 9 a.m., how to become bankable, bankable and look good on paper. You know what I'm going to do? I have a, cl a class we did. It's a two hour, no, no, it's a presentation, but a little over an hour. It's how to invest out of state, right? And so I bought 10 houses during COVID from my kitchen table in Cleveland from here and wholesale 25. And I, whatever I learned, I put in this presentation. <laughs> so, and it's the same thing as buying local or out of mm -hmm. state, right? So I'll give that training video to anyone that comes to the bankable class. Awesome. Just that, so you have some education to yeah. go with it. And interestingly so, enough, I'm gonna be in Cleveland in a month. You will be awesome. So, yeah. Cool. So I got do business right. up in Cleveland with some guys out there. So I'm be visiting them. Awesome. So how about we do this, Mike? So they can get that free training when they show up on the 15th if they mention Asria show. There you go. 
Okay, so there you go. I might mention it on Monday though. What? <laughs> See, when I make things up, that the team's gonna kill me. Dude. Like, why do you markets just make up this whole marketing plan on the podcast? <laughs> so, so just um, sorry, some, Molly. Some, sometimes sorry, the best crap is made up on the fly, right? <laughs> yeah. We've made everything up we've said here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so why gotta get? I don't even know what we're doing. But if you if you come on Saturday, you'll get the video. We'll, we'll figure we'll, it we'll out. We'll figure it out from there. So, so guys, um, you know, show up. June 10th, 8600 uh, Anderson Avenue, Scottsdale for the monthly meeting here, Aaron. June 11th, he'll be down in Tucson yep. at the Tucson Area Re- Association of Realtors. And then June 15th, right here, Central Phoenix office, how to become bankable. Man, Aaron, thank you so much. Well, it was my pleasure, yeah. guys. Thanks for letting me come in and talk to the uh, talk to the listeners. Any last words? Anything you want to yeah. share? Last words. Well, one of the – actually – when it comes to real estate, it comes to really anything. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Rounders. Do you guys ever seen that one? It sounds familiar. Yeah, I, re- I remember hearing about I know I probably saw one it. One of my though. favorite movies. In fact, I made all my kids watch when they turn 18 because you get to learn that you're going to have a different one of those people in your life. You need to figure out who in your life you're going to want to interact with and, and, and connect with and, and build relationships with. Um, and it's a, it's a book about basically, I mean, it's a movie about poker, right? And um, there was a quote in there. And uh, this guy says then in the in the book Confessions of a Winning Poker po- Player, Jack King said, "Few players recall big pots they have won. Strange as it seems, but every player can remember with remarkable accuracy the outstanding tough beats of his career." Mm-hmm. You're going to get your ass kicked as you're getting into real estate investing. It's just going to happen. Mm-hmm. Nothing we can do is going to just rain uh, platters of lemonade and brownies on you. It's going to be a difficult slog through this to become successful. Mm-hmm. Nothing in, of value is ever easy, but. There is huge value in the ass beating that you do take because you remember those lessons better. We, we don't remember everything we did become very successful on right. certain things. You don't remember that sometimes it's like, what's interesting about being an entrepreneur, you are just working at it, working at it, working at it, and then all of a sudden one day it just works and you don't know what actually mm-hmm. worked. It's not like when I was growing up on the cattle ranch or I was working in the, in the oil fields, you got to see the progress of what you were doing because it was happening right in front of right you with your hands. You don't see that in entrepreneur world, oh, but you remember God, yeah. when you did something stupid because yeah. you have a scar from it. The scars are the most valuable things you can have. Our memory is one that works very well on things that hurt us. And I've got a story about that I won't share, but I'll probably share it when I'm speaking there about me as a six-year-old in school. I still remember the situation when I was in school. In fact, hell, I'll just share the damn thing. Why not? <laughs> yeah. So I was six years old. We went to a little Pentecostal school. I didn't go to kindergarten. They put me in uh, a school that had from, from first grade till 12th, right? And I was only five of us first graders were segregated off and being taught by the pastor's wife. And we were going through the letters of the alphabet. And the way we were going through the letters of the alphabet in the 70s, they had the uh, film strips. Right, so mm-hmm. it would you know, have a little little nursery rhyme, and you, you know, when it beep, you go to the next frame on this film strip, and then we got to the letter M about a mule named Milton. And the way the limerick went, it said, Milton the mule, he made a mistake. As he read a map, he walked in a lake, and it had this little film strip of this mule walking, holding this map, and he falls in the lake. Kind of dumb, but we remembered it, mm-hmm. right? Well, me being me, even at six years old, I created my own limerick, right? And mm-hmm. instead of Milton falling in a lake, I, lake, I had him pissing in a bucket. Kind of dumb, but okay. I was sick, <laughs> right? The little girl laughed about it next to me, who I whispered it to. Well, the teacher heard it. She grabbed us both by the earlobes and drug us into the principal's office, which was her husband. He was the pastor. Sat us down, and I had to recite this to him. This guy was a really big man. Mm-hmm. When I was done reciting it, he didn't say anything. He just turned. He picked up his aircraft aluminum briefcase, dialed the code in, very ceremoniously opened it and turned so I could see it. And inside it was it was padded and cut out to hold his paddle that he had hand carved. <laughs> oh we had to tur- get up, turn around, put our hands on the on our chairs and got our asses beat. Now, I've had way worse ass beatings from my dad, but I still had the tears coming out because of the gravity of the situation. Now, let me ask this question of you guys. How many letters are in the English alphabet? 26 letters. Mike was thinking about it. Right. <laughs> I don't like, want to take, take all the shine. Uh, man. I'm just like, I'm just like I'm give Mark some time here. I'm hogging up the mic. You know. Dude's like, I'm going to have to Google that. Because <laughs> yeah, so. I did. I thought 24. Yeah. 26 letters. How many do you think I remember the limerick for? One. Yeah. One of them. Why? Because I got my ass beat. Mm-hmm. The lessons we learn in life get driven home by the ass beaten. So never, ever, ever discount an ass beaten. When you're going through real estate investing, take note of the things that hurt because that's what's going to guide you to the places where you become successful. 
Awesome. Well said. Well said. Great story. Well said, guys. So make I feel sure like I got hit with a paddle. <laughs> just right here. That was a good story. Yeah. But guess what? You know how many letters in alphabet. Now you? I do. <laughs> exactly. You can go look at that number. <laughs> now I don't got to Google it. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for being loyal listeners to the Asria Show. Remember, we air every Friday at 8 a.m. And remember, our purpose here at Asria is to empower every real estate investor one property at a time. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Perfect. Great show. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks for listening to The Azria Show with your hosts, Marcus Maloney and Mike Delpreet. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you found this information valuable, head over to azria.org and learn more about our community.